good morning class the last class we saw how the entries that were created following the principle of double entry bookkeeping how they were aggregated and finally created a closing balance for each of the accounts and then as an interim measure we also checked by using a trial balance and to make sure whether the aggregate of the debits is equal to the aggregate of the credits and i had already explained that the trial balance doesn't exactly tell you that all the entries that you have made is correct it tells you that the entries that you have made is correct to the extent that the total debits is equal to the total credits and hence you can go ahead under the assumption that the fundamental concepts the accounting principles have not been violated that is why even if you err on the right side still your trial balance would show debit is equal to credit but then when you go ahead somewhere when you create the other financial statements either the balance sheet or income statement the errors that you have inadvertently made will show up but let's for the moment assume and not only assume i think all the entries that we have made we have not violated any accounting principle and when we completed the trial balance we did understand how the debits is equal to the credits and hence at this decision making point we take the decision yes everything is correct and let's go ahead now what do we mean by going ahead we have made all the entries we have recorded all the entries and last class i explained some adjusting entries i gave you three examples the depreciation expense the prepaid expense the accrued interest or the interest payable now these are all examples of adjusting entries they are not the only type of adjusting entries these are some examples of adjusting entries but in real life when you encounter such business activities there will be other types of adjusting entries beyond these three but all of them will be treated as the case demands and then before we go ahead in preparing the other financial statements we will record these adjusting entries just as we did for depreciation and the other adjusting type entries now after the adjusting entries are made the next step is to see how we have to prepare the financial statements let's begin with a balance sheet and income statement first the trial balance that we saw last class was a list of all the accounts and if you go back to your class notes you will see that list comprises different types of accounts you would see cash there you would see accounts receivable there you would see sales revenue there you would see uh, wages there so you understand that the trial balance comprises a list of accounts which are either from the balance sheet category or from income statement category and within the balance sheet it can be from the asset side or the liability side and from the income statement it will be sales revenue and other expenses so in a nutshell a trial balance would have more or less listed all the accounts which either fall under the balance sheet or under the income statement now you understand that a balance sheet and an income statement is hence an extract of those accounts that have been listed in the trial balance and you would notice that in the trial balance we have not recorded those adjusting entries so we need to add those adjusting entries for which we have already made the debit and credit entries as i showed in last class how we recorded the depreciation depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation so from the trial balance plus the adjusting entries 
we are now in a position to create a balance sheet and an income statement. Let us first start with a balance sheet. Now, how do we create a balance sheet? In the first few classes, I had given you a nomenclature, the, the uh, common understanding, the normal set of rules that is followed when we actually create a balance sheet. That begins with writing the name of the firm. In this case, we said it is a restaurant. So, let us say it is x, y, z restaurant. And I told you that we are going to create a balance sheet. So, this is a balance sheet. Balance sheet as of April 30, 2012. Because remember, we recorded all the transactions for a given particular month. In this case, we assumed it to be April 2012. So, this is the balance sheet of XYZ restaurant as of April 30, 2012. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Now, the balance sheet begins with recording those accounts under the assets categories and the liabilities categories. Let us begin with assets. Now, under the asset category, there are two types, the current assets and the fixed assets. So, let us begin with current assets. In the order of liquidity, we start with the current asset that is most liquid and I explain to you that cash gets the first position in that order of liquidity. So, we begin with cash. What is the corresponding value that needs to be recorded here. It is nothing but your closing balance, which is available in the trial balance that we created. And what was the closing balance that was available? It was 5450. That is the closing balance. Next to cash is accounts receivable. What is the closing balance in accounts receivable? Your trial balance shows 0. Why? Because within that accounting period of 1 month, whatever the firm had to receive was collected. So, we had an accounts receivable some at some point of time during that 1 month period and before the end of that 1 month, that was also collected as a result of which the accounts receivable is 0. But in real time, you would have some closing balance. So, whatever is that closing balance will be reflected in your trial balance and that is what gets incorporated in your balance sheet. In this case, it is 0, but it might happen that you will have some numerical value in case you have some receivables yet to be collected at the end of the accounting period. Then inventory. From your trial balance, you find that the inventory value is 550. Next is prepaid expenses. Now, if you look at your trial balance under the category prepaid expenses, you will have some value. But then remember when we talked about the adjusting entry, in this case, this was about the rent of 750 that we paid. At the end of this month, the value of the 750, the entity, the firm, has derived the value. So, no longer is that 750 an asset that the entity will be enjoying. It has actually derived the benefit of that. So, your prepaid expenses will no longer be 750 or the asset value of the prepaid expenses is no longer 750 and at the end of this month, the value of that gets diminished to 0 and that is what we saw when we did the adjusting entry for prepaid expenses. So, your prepaid expense at the end of this accounting period is hence 0. And I do not see any other current asset items in the trial balance nor in the adjusting entries that we have made. 
which means the total current assets will be 6000. So, this is our total current assets. Now, after current assets in the balance sheet, we have the fixed assets. The fixed asset, when we look at the trial balance, the only fixed asset that we purchased was the equipment. So, the equipment and remember our cost principle says recorded at the cost of acquisition. So, equipment at cost, remember we purchased that for 7200. Now, what do we do here? We are at the end of this accounting period, in this case one month. We purchase an equipment whose cost of acquisition is 7200 at the beginning of the month and we have used that equipment. I told you there is a charge for using an equipment for a period of time, whatever be the period on assuming that this is a linear depreciation, to that extent we will charge the entity for using the equipment and this we call it as a depreciation expense. And since this is a straight line linear depreciation, I told you that the life of the equipment is 10 years. So, the monthly charge for using this equipment is 60. So, less accumulated depreciation which is 60. So, what is the net of the equipment? equipment net is 7140. Now, where will this depreciation expense sit that we will understand when we actually do the income statement, but in the balance sheet side you have reduced the value of the equipment by the monthly charge that is recovered from the entity for using the equipment that is 60. So, the book value of the equipment at the end of one month is no longer 7200, but 7150. Do we have any other fixed assets? No, the building that we are using it is on a rental basis. So, we do not capitalize rent expense as because we do not own the building. If it was our own building, then it would have found a place in the balance sheet. Till such time, an asset is capitalized, we do not consider it as a fixed asset. In this case, the equipment is the only asset that has been capitalized and depreciated. So, our total assets in this case will be the current asset 6000 plus the total fixed asset 7140, in this case 13140. Now, this is the asset side. On the other side will be the liabilities plus owner's equity. Now, let us begin the liabilities with the accounts payable. What is the accounts payable? Again, we go back to the trial balance and see that the closing balance for the accounts payable is 2200. Then we had the loans payable, four thousand. And then for this loan, I also said in the adjusting entries, the accrued expenses which is the interest that I am liable to pay on a quarterly period for that particular month is charged at the rate of 40, which is a liability which I have to pay not necessarily now, but at the end of the quarter. So, till such time this will be a liability. So, next month when you do the closing entry it would be 80, because the monthly accrued expense accrued interest expense is 40. income tax 
liability is 285. How did we get that? This is actually linked to the income statement. So, when we go to the income statement, I will also explain how we got that. We have not paid the interest, I mean the income tax. We will be paying it at a time when we actually make the payment, when we are supposed to make the payment. Till such time, we treat it as a liability because for the purpose of calculating the income statement, I have identified that the income tax expense is so and so and that we will be paying some time later and hence till such time it will become a liability. So, I am recording this as an liability. So, the total liability is 6525. I can also probably differentiate here, I can also use current liabilities and long term liabilities, where in long term liabilities the loan payable, I will take it to the long term liabilities, but that does not alter the total liabilities which will still remain 6525. Then is the owner's equity portion. In the owner's equity, we can again go to the trial balance, we will see that the paid in capital, the paid in capital is 5000 that was the owner's money that was put in. Now, what is the total? The total will be 11,525, total liabilities plus paid in capital 11,525. So, there is a difference. A balance sheet should balance, but then here we have 13,140 and here we have 11,525. So, we will leave this here and again revisit after we finish the income statement. So, let us begin with income statement. Now, this will establish the connect between the income statement and the balance sheet. So, it is not that I am just leaving the balance sheet incomplete. I know that there is some portion that needs to be filled, but then I will be filling that after I establish the connect between the income statement and the balance sheet. Then you will understand how all the pieces fall in place. Now, this is an income statement for the month of August for sorry for the month of April for April 2012. What is the top line in an income statement? It is sales revenue. So, you go to your trial balance, you find that the sales revenue is 12,200. Then the cost of goods sold or COGS, we have recorded it to be 6,000. So, the next will be gross margin. So, gross margin in this case is 6,200. So, your sales revenue minus your cost of goods sold is a gross margin. So, after that we record our operating expenses to calculate the operating margin. What are the operating expenses? You go to the trial balance, we see that the wage expenses incurred was 3000, the rent was 750, utilities expense was 450, depreciation is 60. Now, here I have treated the depreciation as an expense. The accumulated depreciation of 60 that was in the balance sheet, the corresponding dual entry here will be the depreciation expense in the income statement. Whether cash has really gone out? we will answer that question when we actually discuss about cash flow. But, we since we have charged the entity an accumulated depreciation of 60 for using the asset, we are treating that as a depreciation expense for the purpose of an income statement. Likewise, the interest expense which is an accrued expense of 40 is treated as an interest expense here. Now, the question is I have not paid the interest now, but I have already told you that I will be paying it sometime later. Now, assume next month I am paying this 40. So, next month when I am doing 
the same income statement balance sheet. Because I paid the interest next month, will I be recording it as an interest expense is a question, a very reasonable question that will arise. No, we will not treat that as an expense, because we have already treated this as an expense in the previous month and identify that expense to be a liability. That is why in your balance sheet, you saw that accrued expense liability. And when we actually make the payment next month, what will happen is cash will be reduced by 40. So, what will you do? Cash credit 40, because cash has reduced, because you actually paid the interest. And then from your accrued expense, it was 40, it no longer is a liability. So, a liability gets reduced by 40. So, when a liability gets reduced by 40, it will be debit 40. So, actually when you make the interest payment next month, the dual entry will be cash credit 40, accrued expense which had a liability, opening liability of 40 becomes 0, for which the entry will be accrued expense debit 40. That will not alter your balance sheet because already you have treated it as an expense in the previous month. So, this that is an interest expense of 40. So, what is the total operating expense? 4300. So, your income before tax is hence 6200 minus 4000. 300 is 1900. Income tax expense at some percentage rate is 285. Therefore, my net income is 1615. Now, this income tax expense of 285 is what you saw in your balance sheet as an income tax liability. Just as we treated an interest expense as an expense for that particular period, but then we will be paying it sometime later. Likewise, the income tax expense also, I am just treating it as an expense for the purpose of this accounting period. And the fact that I have not paid it during this accounting period gets recorded as an income tax liability in my balance sheet. That way, it does not compromise the fundamental equation, the double entry bookkeeping requirement is met. So, actually, when we pay the income tax later, just as the interest expense was adjusted. Likewise, the income tax expense cash 285, income tax liability gets reduced from 285 to 0. This is how the closing entry will be made. Now, I said we will establish a connect between this net income and now the balance sheet. This net income is 1615. Now, for this example that we have created, we know that this restaurant is owned by an individual who's put his own money of 5000 in the business. So, after meeting all the liabilities, tax, interest, everything, we find that the net income is 1615. And this is, for the sake of example, an entity that is owned by an individual. So, it is the individual's the 1615 is the net income available to the owner of the entity, in this case the individual. So, it is the individual's money. Now, what is he doing? He is taking it back and investing in the firm. So, the earnings that is freely available to the owners of the firm, if it is brought back and reinvested into the firm, Already I have told you that is called the retained earnings, 1615. Now, we add all of this. your balance sheet balances. Now, the question is, what if this 1615 was not fully reinvested into the business? In this case, it was a very simple example, where it was a single ownership and 
entire money was reinvested. One, the owner would have taken it and enriched his capital, then my capital gets increased by that amount. Or assume that it is a listed company, there are a lot of owners and from this net income, we distributed some portion as dividends. Then what will happen is net income, dividends, let us say it is x. Then what will happen is your net income after dividends will be 1615 minus x. Now, this is the amount that will go and sit in your retained earnings. Will your balance sheet balance? Yes. Why? Because the net income minus dividends that was disbursed, that amount would be reduced in your cash because no longer will your cash be 5450, it would have reduced by an amount that was dispersed as dividends. So, your cash will also be adjusted, so that your balance sheet now balance and whatever is the income that is available after dividend disbursement is the one that gets into the balance sheet as retained earnings. Now, you can understand that there is a connect between the income statement and the balance sheet, where the retained earnings which is the free cash or the free income that is available to be reinvested into the business gets and sits into the balance sheet in the owner's equity part, because it is the owner's money, that is why it sits into the owner's equity part and then the balance sheet balances. That is why remember I told you in the beginning of the class that the income statement is a little subordinate to the balance sheet, because the end, the end product of the income statement, which is your net income is identified as one small entity in the balance sheet in the form of retained earnings. So, it is the balance sheet that will give more information. I am not saying that the income statement is not important. But an income statement does not convey enough financial information, as much as financial information as a balance sheet would convey based on which we can take informed decision. So, this is how an income statement and a balance sheet will be prepared. And I just took a very fundamental easy example for you to understand how to prepare an income statement and a balance sheet. However, in real terms, nothing is going to change. The accounting principles will remain the same. The way in which we analyze the transactions and record them as T accounts will remain the same. There will be some amount of subjectivity in analyzing the transactions and as a result of which you might have two forms of statements for the same transactions. Both can be correct, except that the way in which I have interpreted and analyzed the transaction is different from the other person and both of them have followed the accounting principles, it is bound to happen. As long as you are able to justify why you interpreted this transaction this way, then both are accepted forms of financial statements. But the fundamental framework that you will be following for any transaction, for any entity. The first thing that you will do is, the moment there is a transaction, you will analyze the transaction. What do you mean by analyzing the transaction? This is the process where once you see some activity has happened and you know that this is going to affect impact some account, you will analyze and see what account gets impacted. Then you journalize the entry. Then you post them to a ledger. Then you had the adjusting entries. And as an interim measure, you also did a trial balance. Adjusting plus those closing entries, if there are any, and then prepare your financial statements. So, you there were transactions you analyze the transactions. On the analysis, you know what type of accounts get affected, 
you post the debit credit and then collectively identify identical accounts, find the closing balance after you have journalized them and posted them in the ledgers. As an entry measure, check whether your debit is equal to credit by way of a trial balance and then you prepare your financial statement. So, this is one accounting cycle. So, after an accounting cycle is over, what happens next? The same thing gets repeated. The same process gets repeated. So, your closing balance at the end of an accounting period becomes the opening balance and then you have transactions. To that opening balance, you will again add the effect of these transactions and again undergo the same process and again at the end of the accounting period, you create financial statement. So, you keep on doing this and at the end of the accounting periods, you will be in a position to create a balance sheet or an income statement. So, this is how a balance sheet and an income statement is prepared. I would encourage the class to actually create your own balance sheet and income statement. You do not have to start a business real time to understand this. You can imagine that you are starting a business and then different ways that you got the finances, you had certain set of operations. You can record these transactions and create a balance sheet and income statement on your own and this by this you will be able to appreciate the ways in which transactions are analyzed, recorded and how each of these transactions are aggregated so that you are able to create meaningful financial statements like a balance sheet and an income statement. Now, I told you that the third important financial statement is your cash flow statement. What do I mean by a cash flow statement? See a balance sheet as I told you, it is a status report. It is a snapshot that indicates the financial strength of an entity. Now, an income statement is a different statement. It is a flow report. An income statement actually focuses on the economic results of an entity's operation. That is the income statement. And we understood how both a balance sheet and an income statement are prepared. Now, what is the need for a cash flow statement? Now, our revenue recognition, we are, we are actually recognizing revenue generating tasks. Whether cash has gone into the entity because of this revenue generation task, we are not that much concerned because the moment we recognize that this activity is a revenue activity, we recognize them. Likewise, when we actually measure the resources that have been consumed to generate this revenue, we treat them as expenses. Whether cash has gone out because of this resource consumption, we are not concerned, not that we are not recording. We really do not wait for cash to go out before it is treated as an expense. That also becomes an expense, because we are following an accrual method of accounting, where we do not wait for cash to physically get in or cash to physically get out to recognize our revenues or expenses. Our principle of revenue recognition and the matching concept informs us that as long as we are reasonably certain that this is a revenue generating task, we please recognize it as a revenue. As long as it is reasonably possible that, that this will be an expense, you treat it as an expense. So, with, with, with that understanding, not waiting for cash to physically get in or get out, we treat certain transactions as revenues or expenses. But that does not mean, as I told you, cash has gone in or cash has got out, which means the cash that we see in the asset is not the income, is not the revenue. That is why you see your net income is different, your sales revenue is different, whereas your cash in your balance sheet is different, which means that the behavior of cash has to be understood properly. Now, why do we need to understand? the behavior of cash. We need to understand that because that is the one that provides information on three broad set of activities of a firm. 
what are these activities, I will explain in detail later. But there are some activities within a firm that influences the behavior of cash. It could be an operating activity, it could be a financing activity or an investing activity. Broadly, these three type of activities will influence the behavior of cash. And remember, when we discussed about balance sheet, I said there is this source and use of funds view of a balance sheet. Where did we generate the source of finance and how it got deployed? This we will understand it when we see the balance sheet. Likewise, when we see cash 5450 in the balance sheet, it is not that 5450 got into the firm. It means a lot of activities have happened in the, in the firm within a given accounting period or between two accounting period. The resultant of all these activities have impacted cash in different ways. And when we analyze the ways in which this has impacted cash, we find that the sum total of all the impact has resulted in a final closing balance of 5450. So, it is not that just the closing balance was 3000, somebody cash came into the firm, the value of that was 2450 and the closing balance was 5450. It is not as simple as that. It could be as simple as that, but invariably a lot of activities would have happened, which would have changed the behavior of cash and the resultant change of that behavior is this 5450 that you see sitting in the balance sheet. We need to understand what has happened to cash. Why is that resultant 5450? How is that? The resultant cash flow is 5450. Why is it important? to understand this, because there are users of this information could be internal or external. As somebody internal to the organization, I need to see whether the result of all the operating activities has actually generated cash or consumed more cash. Is there an operating profit or not? As an external user, let us say I am an investor in this. I will see the propensity of the firm to generate enough cash that can be disbursed as dividends. As a banker who has lent money to the entity, I can see the potential of this firm. I want to see the potential of this firm to generate cash to meet my interest liability. Suppose there is an operating loss, that is the firm's operations is not generating enough cash to cover its own operations. Then as a banker, I would be concerned, because if it is not able to generate cash to cover its own operational activities, it cannot meet its bank liabilities. Versus the case of a shareholder, I can never expect dividends. So, these are different types of users of this cash flow information, who will actually dissect the cash movements to see whether each of their liabilities will be met by this entity, whether this entity is generating enough cash to meet such liabilities. And it is for this purpose, we will need to understand what a cash flow statement is all about. Now, this cash flow statement summarizes two important things. And this typically we say it, it as where got, where gone or the source and use of cash between two accounting periods. Let us say we, we had a balance sheet end of one accounting period and we have a balance sheet at the end of the successive accounting period. And in each of the balance sheet, you will have the cash figure. So, you will find that there is a difference. Now, the endeavor to prepare a cash flow statement is to understand what has happened between these two successive accounting periods 
that has resulted in this difference in the cash that we see in the balance sheet. Now, how do we know that? That we will know if we study what has happened to the various activities that are related to the cash generating sources, sources of cash versus those that have consumed the cash or uses of cash, the source and use of cash. How will we do that? Then we will begin to look at different type of activities that have actually used cash, that have actually brought in cash to the firm, could be because of various operational activities, some new borrowings, stocks could have been issued or you would have disposed assets and that could have brought in cash. Likewise, the use of cash could be to pay dividends, repayment of loans, probably you could have used cash to retire some stocks, stock repurchases, buy new equipment. So, you will have different activities that affect some of the account categories which have a direct bearing on cash. Either it could be the ones that have consumed cash or the ones that have generated cash to the firm. Now, we need to see how this has influenced the opening cash and what has happened during this accounting period and why the closing cash is this way. So, when you make a cash versus cash comparison between two successive accounting periods, a cash flow statement will capture precisely the influence of certain activities on critical accounts, which could be operating, investing or financing activities and how that has changed the value of cash from what it was during the time of the opening, that is the beginning of the accounting period and what has happened during this accounting period, the end of the accounting period as a result of what has happened, how the opening cash balance has changed so in and how we have arrived at this closing cash balance. For this for the purpose of easy understanding, I told you that the activities are divided into broadly three categories, the operating activities, the investing activities, the financing activities. So, next class we will sit and understand how when we take the balance sheet between two accounting periods and make a comparative analysis of each of the account categories that have a direct bearing on cash and then understand how this has changed the behavior of cash, whether it has increased or decreased, whether it has consumed cash or generated cash. And the summation of all this plus the opening cash balance has to necessarily be the closing cash balance for the successive accounting period that you see in the balance sheet. Will that happen? If our understanding, if the way in which we are doing this analysis is correct, which means if our cash flow statement is correct, then you would see that the ending cash balance in the balance sheet for the successive accounting period can be obtained by just taking the opening cash balance of the previous accounting period and analyze the impact of all the transactions during the accounting period, the next accounting period and add it to the opening cash balance, it will definitely 
match to the closing cash balance that you see in the balance sheet. How? We will see that in next class. Thank you.